Hey everyone, it's me, John Lorden. And it is me, Danielle Hallen, and welcome to another episode of Crime After Crime. Episode 12. Oh my goodness, can I you, know. Can you believe that? Um, I don't remember, I think it was the last episode or maybe the episode before, I got the number wrong and I had to edit it out of the final product. <laughs> um, but I'm certain this one is episode 12 because I know our next episode is going to be our one year anniversary. I know, it's so crazy. I was on, I can't remember what social media platform I was on the other day, but I had one of those kind of flashbacks come up and it was me setting up this office that I'm sitting in right now and I had like a tiny little desk and my brand new microphone and I was like teasing people about, about the podcast. I'm like, fun stuff coming, you won't believe it. Yeah. But it was, it doesn't feel like, I mean, it's flown by. Yeah, Like yeah. absolutely flown by, it's unbelievable. It really has and I just wanna give a very big thank you to everyone that has supported us and told your friends and family about it. Something is working because we once again noticed uh, more growth on the podcast. Yeah, I mean, just the numbers we're getting here are amazing. I didn't know if it would work in a monthly format because I was worried yeah. that people kind of trail off. But the way that that chart's going, it's telling me mm -hmm. something different. It's working. So thank I know, you all. And a huge, huge thank you because that was something that John and I definitely put a lot of consideration into is, you know, the type of format we wanted and we wanted to do something different and we were worried about only doing, you know, one episode a month, but here we are. I honestly, I knew it would be great either way, but I'm shocked at, you know, how many viewers listen to this podcast and how great you guys are, how dedicated you guys are, the yeah. amount of votes that we get. You know, I was worried people wouldn't want to vote. It would be too much, but you guys are always so interested and really involved in these podcasts. And that's what I think is so great personally about our podcast is how much we kind of all work together and you guys are included in this. It's not just John and I. So huge thank you. It's it's a really great feeling to see those numbers jump all the time. Absolutely. And we had our first big meetup back at CrimeCon and that was the most successful meetup I've done yet. I've only tried to do a couple, but none were as successful as that. And I think once again, it's just going to show there's something that you guys like about crime after crime and i'm so happy you do because i want to do this with danielle for a good long time into the future yep he's never getting rid of me <laughs> <laughs> oh you guys heard it you heard it that's a commitment um all right so just to remind everyone to vote you can follow us on twitter at crime after pod and you can vote there for seven days after the episode drops or you guys can also vote on YouTube. If you are on a computer, you can just hover your screen and hover over your screen with your mouse and there should be an I that pops up, a letter I. You can click there and vote for John or myself. I'm pretty sure you can do the same thing on a mobile as well. So we're getting the hang of it. We finally, it's yes. taken a year, but we've got this We've got this down now. Yeah, and you guys have it down too, because we're not hearing any complaints about being able to vote like we did. Do <laughs> you remember the first couple months? <laughs> the first couple, it was so hard. And the funniest thing about it all that I think is that me and you are both YouTubers and we've both been yeah. on YouTube for so long and we, and I have no we idea. couldn't figure out how to make any of it work. These people were like, don't you know? I know. You're a YouTuber, you should know how to do this. I'm like, honestly, uh, yeah. help me. Find a, find a YouTube me. video on how to do that. Yeah, no, we, <laughs> we've got it down now. Maybe we should put up a YouTube video on how to do it. <laughs> All right, it's that time for voting results with Danielle. And this is for the last episode, Stolen on the 4th of July. All right, guys, this one, whew. Someone was blown out of the water here. Uh -oh. <laughs> so on the Twitter poll, I received 34% of the votes and John received 66%. And then on YouTube, I received 29% of the votes and John received 70. So the total so far, I have five that I have won and John has won six. We have just had this pattern going on over and over again, <laughs> but I'm going to now reluctantly hand you over the coffee mug. All I'll right. take it back next month. Here All you go, right. John. You promise you're going to take it back? Thank you. There's the coffee yeah. mug. What did I'm you put in it this time? Mm. Jack Daniels and Coke. Perfect. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping, I'm telling you, we've been in such a pattern. Yeah. We'll see. 
I'm going to be I'm going to be interested to see if it's just like a flat out John win. Like out of nowhere, this whole like back and forth thing just stops. Mm. Well, we did have runs, though. We had runs where I kind of went up a little bit and runs where you came back strong. This is like the prize fight of true crime that's going on here. <laughs> we did figure out that, you know, we really wanted to name a winner for season one. So if we get to the next episode and we tie it, if it does go 6-6, six, six, we're going to tally up all of the percentages. And then whoever had the most in terms of percentage will be the winner. So one way or another, Danielle. This thing's going down for season one. We're going to figure out who came out on top. All right. Um, so today's topic is criminal doctors. And once again, want to give a very big thank you to Mariah for suggesting that. I did a little research and we're going to share with you guys how you can avoid becoming a patient of a criminal doctor. I want to give a very big thank you to verywellhealth.com for posting some of this information we're going to share with you. And I feel like this is great. I'm really happy John did a lot of this research because I feel like not enough people really consider that they're putting so much of their life into someone else's hands. I think we're all aware of that, but we don't think about things like this that could happen. And after doing a lot of the research I did for this particular case I chose, um, I will forever from now on be very careful about who I choose. So oh, I feel the same. Yeah, we're, we're basically exactly. we're going to give you guys two very good yeah. reasons to follow this, this Exa information. Exactly. Yeah. One important step in choosing the right doctor is to do a background check on that physician. You may not have the time to do that research on that doctor before you're examined, your first examination, but you can still do it as soon as possible afterward. And if you find that you don't like that doctor's background, you can try to change doctors later. That's a lot. That's a lot of people get hung up on that thought of like, yeah. oh, you know, but I've already met with them and all that kind of. So what? You're putting essentially a team together for helping you with your life. So make sure you've got the right teammates there and don't be afraid to swap them out. I had a doctor I went to for a while and uh, I remember I had quit smoking and I had been hearing mm -hmm. for years before that, you know, you got to quit smoking, you got to quit smoke. So I quit smoking and I go in there. I'm like, Hey, I quit smoking. And like, he didn't say anything. I was just like, what the heck? <laughs> Give me a Where's little, Where's my like, celebration? Yeah, good job. Pop, or, you know, pop some confetti here. Yeah, or maybe he's, maybe he's planning on me, like falling right back into it a week later or something. I don't know. It was just so weird. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I, I swapped them out. I was like, okay, there we I'm going go. to find a different doctor. Uh, to research a doctor, you'll need to start with his or her name and location. You can go to the Federation of State Medical Boards. That's the FSMB website and check the basics with their docinfo.org search function. You'll find the doctor's board certifications, education, states with active licenses, super important. You wanna make sure he's licensed in the state where you're seeing him, uh, and any actions against the physician will be noted there as well. The FSMB site will list any actions related to medical malpractice, but you may want to do further web searches for the doctor by name for suits that may be pending. And I have done that just in terms of researching cases before, and you can find legal documents on a lot of lawsuits, so. And what's actually so crazy is I've been in a position where I should have done this. I actually found out after the fact that a doctor I had, you know, had surgery with, <laughs> Wow. had a malpractice suit going against him but i and i had actually done very extensive research on him beforehand but i did not know that site existed and i didn't know exactly what to search for and so i didn't find out till after the fact i just happened to be looking through some of his reviews because i felt like something wasn't right with what was done with me and sure enough and actually, I found out through a review. Someone had left a review that he couldn't take down. I think it was on Yelp or somewhere. And through right. that, I was able to do proper research. But check every way possible. Because even when you do what you think is extensive research, you still might miss something. So there are also reasons you want to establish the approximate age of your doctor. One, if a doctor is quite a bit older than you are, may retire or leave the practice before you get older yourself. And I'm that... I'm literally yeah. going through this right now. Yeah. I, and I love my doctor. Um, it's just he's a bit older than me and he's at that point where he's going to retire. And now I'm going to have to follow these steps we're talking about so I can find my next one. And in my situation, they're bringing other doctors in to that hospital or in, into that office. And they're kind of trying to direct you to the new guys automatically. 
don't just roll for the automatic default. Once again, just take the opportunity, do the research, make sure you're finding the right guy. Trust me, you're going to hear the stories. They're coming. Yes, um, they are. <laughs> you may be interested in seeing a doctor who has been in practice a long time and is therefore very experienced. Conversely, you may also be interested in a younger doctor who has been taught in medical school more recently and he knows how to use or he or she knows how to use more modern equipment or maybe more up to date on research in a specialty area. So kind of two good reasons for why approximating their age, you might not be able to find their exact age, but getting some idea of that might be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you may be able to assess how long a physician has practiced in one place at your state's medical licensing board site. If a doctor is 50 years old but appears to have been practicing in his, his or her location for fewer than 10 years, that indicates an interruption in his or her practice. An interruption may be due to a variety of circumstances. For example, a doctor may have decided to move to Florida and will retire in a few years, or he may have lost his license due to negligence in another state before moving to their current location. No foreshadowing involved. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, to find general commentary about a doctor's practice, you might turn to some of the online doctor's rating sites. However, be aware that these ratings are subjective and may have been influenced in many ways. Foreshadowing, also foreshadowing. Also not foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> but websites you can check out are uh, www.healthgrades.com, www.webmd.com, and www.ratemds.com. On top of all that, Danielle touched on this. You can also check them out on Yelp, Angie's List, Facebook. Be your own little detective here and really dig in. You want to make sure you're finding the right team member to help you with your health. Learn more about how to find a great doctor and more at www.verywellhealth.com. And hopefully you'll be able to avoid dun, 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 criminal doctors. And we're here. All right, Danielle, are you ready? I am. Honestly, I was so excited for this particular subject because it's fascinating to me. I've covered Harold Shipman before, who was a serial killer doctor on my channel. But this time I got a very different feel. Some of the stories that I went through are possibly some of the most terrifying. Um, like I was saying before, I feel like we don't really consider a lot about doctors. We put a lot of our trust in them for good reason. But I feel like that also prevents us from really thinking about what they could potentially do to us. And that is kind of the situation that's happening with my case, which is Christopher Dunch. And some of you might actually be familiar with this man. So Christopher Dunch, he hadn't always had dreams of becoming a neurosurgeon. He had actually grown up in Memphis, Tennessee, majority of his life. And after he graduated from high school, he had ambitions of becoming a college football player. Very, very different from being a neurosurgeon. But unfortunately, his plans did not work out. And after bouncing around at a few schools, he settled on Memphis University. But at this point, he had exhausted his eligibility. So he had to look into new career paths. And this is where his terror as a neurosurgeon began. So Christopher completed the MD PhD program at the University of Tennessee, and he later went on to complete a spine fellowship program. And despite what appeared to be great success in the field thus far, his problems actually began while he was in school. So this is how you know the stories turn in real bad real quick. In his fourth year of residency, Christopher was expect or suspected of being under the influence of cocaine Ooh. while operating. Oh, wow. Because... And you know what? And that's terrifying. But honestly, the next thing I'm about to say almost concerns me even more. Because of this, they did find out about this. He was sent to an impaired physician's program, but he essentially received a slap on the wrist and was released back to residency where he would go on to do so much worse. Yeah, that's scary. I, so, I just I didn't know that there was an impaired physician's program. I'm just to know that there's a program. I mean, I guess with the pressure these guys are dealing with, um, yeah, it, it's going to yeah. happen. But wow, wow. And the access to drugs, being around them all the right. time. I, I I get it, but what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> so by 2010, Christopher was operating in Dallas, Texas at Baylor. And despite being new to the field, he was constantly boasting to his colleagues about his abilities. Many fellow surgeons got a really bad vibe right off the bat because he seemed to have this huge ego with not much to back it. But somehow his reputation online with patients was overwhelmingly positive, which is what brought all of his patients to him. He had put out an info infomercial advertising his services and he had glowing five-star reviews 
online, it appeared as if he was an, a phenomenal surgeon, but the reality was far from what it seemed. Within the very first year of working as a surgeon, multiple patients left his operating room severely maimed and some no longer alive. Whoa. He let a patient internally bleed to death on his table despite being told to fix the situation by the entire staff in the room. So many patients were left with botched work, whether screws had been put in too deep and were left poking nerves, surgeries mm. were not only done wrong, but they were unnecessary to begin with. There were even examples where there was a surgery done or some sort of prosthetic or something put in place, one of the cages that never needed to be done to begin with. And wow. people started questioning his work. So this forced him to resign and he moved on to Dallas Medical Center. So within one week, he was again dismissed after the death of another patient and maiming of another. So 74-year-old Mary Eford had gone in for a spinal fusion surgery only to have her, get this, this is the wildest thing ever, her nerve roots severed. I think one was actually technically amputated. Surgical hardware was left in her back muscles. Mm. And she lost one third of her blood during surgery and full use of her legs. Wow. Yeah. So Dr. Henderson was the surgeon that came in to attempt to fix the mess that Christopher had made. And he was shocked at everything he found. He said that the work that had been done on Mary looked more like a child playing with tinker toys than actual surgery. To him, it appeared as if every single thing had been done intentionally wrong. The implants had been placed in her muscle instead of her bone. There was a screw drilled into her spinal cavity for no apparent reason. But despite the fact that every surgery he did, and when I say every I'm being I'm being very, very literal with that. Every surgery he did ended in death or maiming. There was somehow, you know, no information out there to indicate that any investigation was ever done at this point or if the hospital even notified the Texas Medical Board at all about Christopher's outcome with his patients. Wow. So a few people had called into the medical board, but so far nothing was being done. And Christopher was able to move on to the University General Hospital in Dallas by the spring of 2013. Shortly after he started to practice at that hospital, he severely maimed another patient. A patient went in for surgery and Christopher mistook a part of his neck muscle for a tumor. And while trying to remove this tumor, he severed one of the victim's vocal cords, cut a hole in his esophagus, sliced an artery in the process, and then proceeded to leave a surgical sponge embedded in his throat. So another surgeon, Dr. Kirby, was quickly brought in to fix the situation. And again, another sur surgeon was mortified of Christopher's work. The new surgeon said it looked like the work of a crazed maniac. And Dr. Kirby said he strongly believed that the intent was to kill the patient. Wow. So... Exactly. So he, at this point, has only worked in, I think, two or three places. He did work for a little stint in one place where nothing happened that I know of. Um, but every surgery he's done so far has resulted in a death or a maiming. And multiple surgeons at this point have said specifically he's doing this on purpose. So after this, the surgeons that witnessed the aftermath of Chris Christopher's work pushed the Texas Medical Board to act. So by July 26th of 2013, Christopher's license was suspended and by December 6th, it had been completely revoked. And Christopher went on a downhill spiral to say the least. He ended up robbing a Walmart of like the most bizarre things. He came in in like a suit and robbed, I mean, I think he took pants and... Um, oh my gosh, what was it? Just like random household items that you wouldn't need on a daily basis. He likely had no money left at this point and he ended up in jail. But it didn't stop. It doesn't stop here either. <laughs> oh, I just, I don't get, I, it's really strange to me. This is a guy that would go to school for such a prolonged period of time to learn about how to do this type of stuff. And I, I think that's why the conclusion that the other doctors are coming to is, is point it's it's on point yep. because yep. he should have been trained to do this stuff properly and they can tell it's not even that he's failing at doing it properly he is exactly. completely butchering these people oh wow. just wait yeah wow. so in march of 2014 three of his former payment patients that he had left maimed after a surgery including mary eford filed federal court suits against baylor which is where he originally was practicing um, they allege that Baylor actually allowed him to continue to perform surgeries knowing he was a danger, which I completely agree with because at that point, every surgery he did there ended, I think, I think in total he did like 38 and 32 of them ended in maiming or death. Mm. Um, yeah. So 
they said that he was, they continued to let him perform. But unfortunately, I couldn't find out exactly what happened to these suits. I guess the Texas attorney, Greg Abbott, at the time filed a motion to intervene in hopes of defending Baylor. Um, but it didn't go very far. But Dr. Kirby and Dr. Henderson were not satisfied that Christopher, in theory, could continue to practice. Christopher had already spoken with multiple people about gathering papers to get his license in another state. So when his main patients were told about this, it caused an uproar. The people that spoke to them said they were crying. They were begging to help get him locked up for good. And that was pretty much enough for Dallas DA to pursue criminal charges. The problem, however, was proving that Christopher's actions were intentional and not accidental. And this caused a huge delay in any charges. So in 2015, the statute of limitations was about to run out and they knew something had to be done. So they interviewed dozens, dozens of patients and it it was fairly clear that Christopher's actions were absolutely intentional, and they were able to prove this even further by an email that he had sent out in 2011 after the first two deaths and maimings. What he says is terrifying. First of all, I'm pretty sure he was emailing a female friend of his. Um, I've seen also it was possibly a colleague, which is a little bit more alarming. I'm not sure which one it was, but in the entire thing, he was referring to himself as God first of all, which is never a good thing for a doctor to be saying. Yeah. And the final thing that he said that really was a straw that broke the camel's back was that he said, I'm ready to leave the love and kindness and goodness and patience that I mix with everything else that I am and become a cold blooded killer. Whoa, whoa. He went so off the edge. Yeah. So he essentially is admitting that, you know, he mixes all these good parts in with everything else that he is, which he's admitting is a cold blooded killer. So finally, yeah. Christopher was arrested and charged with six felony counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, five counts of aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury, and one count of injury to a child, elderly, or disabled person. So Christopher's attorneys, man, oh my goodness. So they mm. argued. <laughs> oh, I feel like I always find the craziest arguments from yeah. the defense side. Um, they argued that it was impossible to determine his intentions. They chalked it up to poor training in bad hospitals. They quite literally said that Christopher only knew he had done a bad job after hearing the prosecution explain why and how each maiming occurred <laughs> while sitting in court. That was their that was their defense. That's how they he claimed, learned. Oh, yeah. So then they claimed that he was just not a skilled surgeon <laughs> and he was easily distracted by a chaotic operating room and he was just doing the best he could on his own. Do you know if they did any more drug tests on him? I mean, he just sounds like someone that is just gone. Oh, it keeps it keeps going. This is a John story. I found a good one this time. <laughs> yeah, you sure did. Wow. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, their their argument doesn't even make sense in itself. And prosecutors knew that. And they knew that these excuses weren't, weren't going to hold up well in court. Because after years of training, like you had mentioned, John, he should have known what he was doing. Right. And if he didn't, he should have known better than to continue surgeries. Plus, the work he left behind could only be done by someone that knew what they were doing and were doing the exact opposite. So that suggested he knew how and was choosing not to. And when they were looking at all of the different surgeries, um, there was one in particular that they focused in on, which was Mary's, which is why I included her name. He had actually done that particular surgery a few other times right before and it ended badly. So he knew how it would end if he did those things and he still right. did it. So they really pushed that and it led them to kind of focus on the charges of injury to a child, elderly or disabled person because Mary was in her 70s and it held the highest punishment because they wanted to make sure they found a sentence to where he could not ever harm anyone again. And while any of those charges would have landed him as a felon and he would not have been able to continue practicing medicine, they wanted to make sure he was in jail as long as possible. So they ended up bringing out over a dozen patients to take the stand that he had maimed to wow. prove he knew he was doing wrong and to hopefully show the jury how badly so many people were affected. And I've actually seen a few video clips of this from Crime Watch Daily when they covered it. And it is absolutely some of the most heartbreaking things I've ever seen. It's people that just went in because of pain and they yeah. came out paralyzed. There was a victim 
that passes out so often from chronic pain that he can't go to his son's football games or really leave the house. They brought forward a victim that passes, or not passes out, but they uh, brought forward a victim that is forced to now wear a brace and a cane because of permanent nerve damage in his spine. Um, there's a victim that has to speak in a whisper because of an infection that started after puncture wounds were left in his throat after a surgery. And probably the one thing that got to me the most is they brought forward one of his best friends. Mm. And yes, you heard that right. He paralyzed one of his best friends during surgery. Um, he is so badly disabled. He's in a wheelchair. It has to be rigged so that he can be comfortable. And every few minutes, he just shuts down because of so much pain. And then speaking of Christopher's friends, they brought in another close friend of his, and this will answer your question, that proved his habits of using drugs while performing surgeries hadn't stopped in his residency. So this particular friend said that she would party with Christopher on a regular basis and he would use cocaine, alcohol, and then he would take things like Adderall, you know, Ritalin, things like that. He would party all night, not go to sleep, and then leave still on these drugs to go and do his rounds at the hospital. And she said she remembered one time in specific where he went to St. Jude's on cocaine. Whoa. Oh, my God. Exactly. So he they asked him about it. He pled the fifth interesting yeah but that's pretty much all it took after 13 days of trial and only four hours of deliberation the jury found him guilty and on february 20th 2017 he was sentenced to life in prison he is not eligible for parole until he's 74 years old and 2045 um, all four of the major hospitals that employed christopher all have ongoing civil cases against them to this day yeah in 2018 the texas court of appeals affirmed Christopher's conviction. And then in 2019, they refused his petition for another review. I think in total, 32 or 34 people were permanently affected by his surgeries, which was almost all of his surgeries. It makes you wonder if that is part, if that became part of the problem here, um, hearing about the civil suits that are being levied against those hospitals now. Um, if when they realized that something was wrong, they were just like, okay, just get rid of them and get them out, you know, yeah. as opposed to reporting it. Because if it was reported at that point, then they might be admitting some level of responsibility or something along those lines. Maybe, maybe it was a bit of an administrative defensive maneuver to try to just scoot him along and not make a big deal out of it. Uh, when you would, I mean, if you're talking about this number of victims, you know they're talking up. You know they're contacting people and saying, yep. hey, what happened? I'm, I'm in wicked pain. I'm in worse pain now than I was before, um, which is another trail that I'm sure that they would have brought up in the trial as well to show, hey, there was yeah. all this communication that was being sent your way about these things not going right, and you just kept moving on thinking you, know, you were doing great surgery. Well, I, one of the interesting things, and I was never able to figure out who this man exactly was, but there was, I think, one man that was looking into this into this case, he was given this information being faxed over information um, about what was happening. And he saw the cover sheet and the name on the cover sheet, and he was actually one of the victims. Mm. He had actually been on Christopher's surgical table and had been hurt by him. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it was just an endless amount of people. And, you know, some of these people were again saying they were like his reviews were great that's why i went there and so that's kind of you know why i was saying earlier be careful you know where you check your reviews and all of that because he appeared to be a phenomenal doctor you right. know every all the infomercials that he put out all the five star reviews that he had and in some places it's very very easy to fake those yeah um very easy to create them yourself and create an idea of something that's just not real so it's a good point to to really not trust one source in particular for something like that. That's why even in that information we gave you guys earlier, we're exactly. including several different ways to look and you should use all of them or even more if you can mm -hmm. find them. You're, you're really and Danielle knows this from the research work we do um, for our YouTube channels. You're trying to get information from several different sources and then you kind of lay it on top of each other and the points yeah. that make sense all of a sudden stick out and the points that don't fit stick out and they're worth investigating more. So, exactly. you know, if you see things that look too weird and things aren't really lining up as you're looking from Yelp to Angie's List to Facebook to you know WebMD, all these different sites, 
that might be enough to give you an indicator. Something's weird about this, you know, this doctor's profile. I'm just going to move on. There's a lot of doctors out there. <laughs> yeah, there's a yep. lot and there are some really great ones um, but obviously the other sad thing about this Danielle is as bad as a life in prison sentence is he's not going to deal with any of the things that he actually put these people through I, I almost wish nope. there was some way that you could like hook him up to a machine and like oh you know you're, know. you're now going to get to experience what you put this person through for the next you know year or two it's um, exactly. And it's it's heartbreaking to me because he did a lot of things with the spine. And while yeah. some of it was kind of like a life or death situation, a lot of those things are elective. You know, it's kind of one of those things where you are you're struggling with pain right. and you could either go and do something that could help it or, you know, just live with it. And you could live with it and potentially be OK. And a lot of these people went in just trying to take their pain away and left paralyzed on one side of their body or with a you know a respirator and a feeding tube because their esophagus has been you know punctured open um the yeah. one woman that he let kind of bleed out on the table she loved christmas and she was decorating with her family and she was up on a ladder and she had fallen back and fallen on, on her back mm -hmm. and it it just caused her a lot of pain she saw a lot of therapists and there wasn't necessarily i think anything wrong like there wasn't something that needed immediately to be fixed but she wanted a solution to her pain after a while and it ended up killing her it's just it's very interesting and to take it back to the whole you know the hospital's not reporting it i was reading something about how hospitals and their doctors there's a lot of liability issues like the yeah. laws just do not protect either side very well so you know i was telling you john earlier before this but i'm covering another doctor case on my personal channel in the next couple of weeks and it's the same thing where hospitals didn't report something because liability reasons and it could get them in trouble they could be liable for what happened plus they could get in trouble for you know potentially falsely accusing an employee of something so it's it's a it's right. very muddy muddy waters so but it's just so crazy to me to see how many people saw a problem and somehow he managed to hurt that many people. Yeah. Still, he kept on going. Terrible, man. I, I think uh, they should tattoo the Hippocratic Oath on his forehead very slowly. Yep. <laughs> yep. Wow. Um, terrible. Terrible. Wow, Danielle. You might have me beat. That was... Uh, I don't know. That's a pretty rough one. Um, I think what's sick about it is just the maliciousness that he knows that he's doing wrong and he's just going forward with it anyway. He was anyway. just doing it. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, the fact that he confessed that he wanted to, you know, throw away all of his happy act and become the, you know, cold-blooded killer he was, that's right. terrifying. Yeah. Because it, it was already an odd jump to me to go from wanting to be a, a college basketball player and, you know, to just randomly jump to becoming... A neurosurgeon? I mean, I know we all have very interesting aspects, but sure. something I feel like, he, I mean, he picked it for a reason because from the start, he immediately was harming people. Yeah. you. I it wonder if, if you'd look into his background more, if there was any history of, yeah. you know, harming animals or anything like that yeah. when he was a child, because mm -hmm. he certainly seems to have the mindset of a serial killer. Um, yeah. Wow. All right. Well, we're going to follow that one up with another criminal doctor. Um, and let me just ask you guys, is there anything worse than hearing from a doctor that you have cancer? Keep, oh that, keep that in mind as we go through this story together. Born in Lebanon in 1965, Fareed Fada obtained a medical degree in 1992 and would focus his career on a disease that has touched so many of our lives cancer. Over 14 million new cases of cancer occur every single year. Cancer knows no boundaries, affecting men, women, and children. The average five-year survival rate for cancer patients in the U.S. is about 66%, according to the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Fada immigrated to the U.S. and served a, res a residency in Brooklyn, then working at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in Manhattan for a number of years, and eventually became an attending physician in Pennsylvania from 2000 to 2003. 
Many people dedicate their lives to fighting the war against cancer, and it seemed that Dr. Fado was no different. In 2003, he moved to Oakland Township, Michigan, and opened Michigan Hematology Oncology, or MHO, in Rochester Hills, Michigan. MHO would become one of the largest cancer practices in Michigan. Within a decade, it would grow to seven locations in the, Metroit, uh, in the metro Detroit area. Dr. Fada focused on treating blood cancers, such as leukemia and lymphoma. He developed his own methods of treatment, which he called European Protocol, an aggressive approach that gave higher doses of chemotherapy drugs more frequently. He quickly earned a reputation of being one of the best cancer specialists in Metro Detroit, treating 17,000 patients over the years at his clinics. He essentially made it a one-stop shop. He owned his own lab, his own pharmacy, and even his own radiation treatment center. In 2009, Dr. Fada became a naturalized U.S. citizen. His wife, Samar, also worked in his business, acting as CEO and CFO for his companies. They had three children together. By all appearances, this man was living the American dream and helping people fight one of the leading causes of death. Or was he? It appears that MHO changed their business practices around 2009. They moved to a model including fraudulent diagnoses, bilking patients and insurance companies out of millions of dollars, and giving toxic chemicals such as chemotherapy drugs and treatments to healthy people. He was literally telling people they had cancer when they didn't, then giving them treatments with terrible side effects such as losing hair, teeth, gums, and even worse. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Oh, that's so terrible. And I find it interesting, though, that he did so much work great for so long, and then all of a sudden, he just it, Isn't that switched. weird? Yeah. That's yeah. so bizarre to me. Um, it's strange because in the first story we heard, we're talking about a severe personality defect where this guy is yeah. hes becoming a, a killer, essentially. Here, exactly. I don't think that's necessarily what's going on here. Uh, I don't know if he's just needing to find more income sources, you know, or mm -hmm. he's just crazy for money. Um, I'm still not positive what the, you know, what the reason yeah. is for him doing this. But one man had lower back pain and he was told that he had a blood cancer that was destroying his bones. He was given chemotherapy and radiation treatments, even though tests that were reviewed by other experts clearly showed he did not have cancer at all. In other cases, terminal cancer patients were overtreated, given terrible side effects to contend with during the end of their lives. One patient was given toxic chemotherapy for five years when the standard treatment cycle was six months. That makes me sick to my stomach. I mean... I think most oh of us goodness. have had a family member go through this and yeah. it is so tough on a person's body. And that's mm -hmm. why, you know, they have recommended cycles like this one's supposed to be six months. He put someone through five years of that. And then hearing, I'm honestly surprised they survived it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and at in, least in, in some cases, it seems that like five years. <laughs> yeah, they might might have not. But then there's the flip side where he's dealing with terminal patients that don't have a chance of really living much longer. And then he's putting them through these aggressive treatments right at the end of their life. I mean, it's just, it's oh any which goodness. way. Wow. Yeah, it seems like any which way he can he can bill them for the most. And remember, he's got all his own services in house. So all these treatments, they're he, they're going to his center to exactly. do all that. Exactly. So he doesn't have to worry about other people kind of questioning things. And yeah, now yikes. I do know, and I don't know if it's because of this or if it's state by state, but I do know that there are some regulations in place where this kind of thing isn't supposed to happen. Where you have the same yeah. organization that's basically handling all these different pieces, but. Um, so what happened with all this? How, how was he found out? An office manager for MHO, George, George Karachi, was hearing from several employees that they had concerns about Dr. Fada's practices. As a matter of fact, several of those employees were quitting. George investigated more and found strong indications of what he believed was medical billing fraud. Back in 1996, George helped expose a similar situation at a Detroit area hospital. When George learned that no one was willing to report what was going on at MHO, he stepped up and contacted an attorney that specialized in whistleblowing cases. Together, 
they contacted the FBI. This is a quote from George. My job was at stake, my livelihood, even my own personal safety. I wasn't looking at the patients anymore as being treated. I looked at it as a burning building with people inside. I had to make it stop and I had to make it stop quickly, he told CBS News. Dr. Fado's Rochester Hills Clinic was raided on August 6, 2013, alleging that Dr. Fada and his wife were engaged in Medicare fraud. MHO fired George the following day. He believed it was because the Fadas found out or at least suspected his involvement with the government raid that occurred the day before. Patty Hester, in her early 60s, was an, a former emergency room technician. There was a knock at her door, and she opened it to find an FBI agent. She told him about her diagnosis and treatment for MDS, a precursor to leukemia. He told her that the bone marrow test results that showed she was suffering from MDS were faked. Now suffering from chronic hair loss and gum tissue problems resulting from unnecessary iron infusions, she commented, he was torturing me so he could get money. We really don't know what he was putting in our system. Dr. Fada was arrested in September of 2014. Now stripped of his medical license, Mr. Fada pled guilty to 13 counts of health care fraud two counts of money laundering, and one count of conspiring to pay and receive kickbacks. That's another interesting angle to this story. I didn't dive into much more, but essentially he was working with, you know, there's all these different cancer groups that are kind of helping patients and some. So there was yeah. some type of kickback deal that he was doing with some of these groups as well, probably for recommending people to his service. $34 million in fraudulent charges were billed to Medicare and private health insurance companies by Dr. Fada and MHO over six years. Rather than use his medical degree to save lives, Dr. Fada instead destroyed them in pursuit of profit, said Assistant Attorney General Caldwell. Time and time again, Dr. Fada callously violated his patient's trust as he used false cancer diagnoses and unwarranted and dangerous treatments as tools to steal millions of dollars from Medicare, even stooping to profit from the last days of some patients' lives. The federal government seized many of his assets and set up a nearly $12 million fund to try to help his victims recover their medical costs and other associated expenses, including any funeral-related expenses. It would not be used towards any pain and suffering claims, lost wages, or travel to go to these doctor's appointments appointments that they likely never needed. Um, those would have to be settled in civil court suits. Whistleblowers typically receive 15 to 25% of the money recovered in cases like this, but George wanted to help the victims get more. So he agreed to take less, somewhere around 10%. He would wind up with $1.1 million. Um, wow. It's weird. It kind of feels like a double-edged sword, but yeah. knowing that he was working for this organization and he was the one brave enough to really bring an end to all this. I do think it makes sense that there should be some type of significant, significant payout to people like that. And, you know, he immediately lost his job. So he's certainly in incurring expenses right off the bat, you know, just stepping up and doing this. Exactly. And that can affect so many different aspects of your life. I mean, you have to find a new job. Heaven forbid you ever have to apply for a loan because you just had to get a new job. They probably won't get you. You know, it's just I, I agree with you. I, I know it's a double edged sword and I feel like a lot of people will feel funny about that. But that's that's scary. And you don't know if what you bring forward is going to get you anywhere. <laughs> it right, could be, right. you know what I mean? Like it could be all crap and you could just be fired and out of everything. But to have that, you know, braveness in you, I guess you could say, to to know that you should be doing good just in case for the sake of it, because if it were bad, yeah. it could be terrible. I I mean, I applaud him a lot. I think well, it's good I, that he got that. I think he, he put it in perspective when he's talking about this is a burning building. You know, he's exactly. essentially trying to get out as many people as he can. Um, but when you're dealing with something like that, you know, a guy that's willing to steal thirty six million dollars. Uh, Ooh, you're, scary. You're, yeah, George is certainly at risk at that point too. I mean, what is it going to yeah. take um, for Dr. Fada to say, you know what, I need to protect my interests here. I need this George guy to disappear. And by exactly. the way, I'm sitting on all these stacks of money. Um, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and know how to use these drugs in a right. very particular way. Yeah, so right. 
During Fado's sen- sentencing hearing, 22 victims testified to the court. Cheers broke out in the courtroom after one victim detailed his story of disturbing misdiagnosis and bad treatments. The judge actually had to remind all the victims that they could be held in contempt if they didn't behave. Other victims talked about losing teeth due to treatments they didn't need, and one man was diagnosed with lung cancer when he actually had kidney cancer. He got the worst of both ends on that. I can't believe that. Um, Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. Uh, Some statements were read by family members of victims that had passed away. Mr. Fada cried as he tried to apologize for his actions. Quote, I misused my talents because of power and greed. My quest for power is self-destructive. I have violated the medical oath and I have caused anguish, hardship, and pain to my patients and their families. They came to me seeking compassion and care. I failed them, he stated. Only three people testified on Mr. Fada's behalf, including a church friend and two former patients. Prosecutors were looking to sentence the 50-year-old to 175 years in prison. Fada's attorneys were trying for a 25-year sentence. On July 25th, 2015, the court made its ruling. Fada was sentenced to 45 years in federal prison. There were no tears on his face at that point, no reaction at all as the sentence was read. His crimes had become known as one of the largest healthcare frauds in American history. In a separate civil suit settlement, 40 of the victims got $8 million. However, low insurance requirements and the statute of limitations are limiting their settlement amounts. Unfortunately, under these circumstances and under Michigan law, Fada's victims were never going to receive fair levels of compensation, said Detroit lawyer Brian McKean. By early 2017, over 700 victims made claims to attempt to recover some of their expenses for mistreatments from the nearly $12 million fund held by the government. At the time of Mr. Fada's restitution hearing, the Detroit Free Press wrote an article which made a very interesting observation. Prison life hasn't been easy for cancer doctor Fareed Fada if his court appearance Tuesday is any indication. He is bald, thin, and looked a little frail an ironic resemblance to the many patients he pumped with chemotherapy when he knew they didn't have cancer. Mr. Fada wanted to speak at the restitution hearing, but the judge denied his request. Patty Hester told reporters she was glad to hear this. The man has nothing to say. Thank you to the Detroit Free Press who did excellent coverage on this case, as well as CBS News and Wikipedia for helping me fill this out a little bit. So 45 years in jail, Danielle, when you're 50 years old. Um, I'm not happy with that. Yeah. I mean, I know I know the, the chances of him ever being released and enjoying the rest of his life are fairly slim to none. But that level of destruction to multiple people's lives, I yeah. mean... I'm scared to get like a pneumonia diagnosis at the doctor or like the flu. And, you know, Powell had cancer when he was young. He had childhood leukemia. And like knowing the things he went through and how it affected everybody in his family, you know, he and he survived it. He's doing great. He's healthy. But like how it has still affected everyone to this day. I could not imagine the type of just emotional torture that caused someone to, you know, believe they could potentially be dying for months, go through all this chemotherapy, go through all this radiation, this treatment, and it sounds like he does way more than is necessary. And then, like, how how would you even be happy after that to hear you don't have cancer? I wouldn't even know how to feel right. at that point because I'd be so emotionally and physically destroyed. It's like you'd want to be happy about that, but then you'd just be in such disbelief at what you'd been put through for absolutely no reason maliciously so someone could have money. Oh, I don't think I've been this angry at someone in a very long time. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he's he's treating all kinds of different people this way. I mean, these are these are elderly people, these are husbands, wives, children, um, just for money essentially and it's it just really breaks my heart that you know when we started this episode we kind of talk about this people inherently trust doctors it's like as soon as you've earned the title Mm -hmm. of doctor that means that people should have some 
level of being able to trust you. And here he literally just shredded that trust just horribly to, you know, 700 people. And to, it's, it's devastating, too, because look at how much good he did before this. Yeah. Well, yeah. And to take things to that point where you're able to build an enterprise like that. Um, and you're helping so many people. Yeah, I don't know what switches, like where all of a sudden you decide you're just going to go this way about it. Um, or if potentially there was cases from before this time period, you know, I yeah. can't imagine that it was like a switch just one day where he's like, okay, we're, re we're really going to scam Medicare. We figured it out. I, I have a feeling there probably would have been some sporadic cases kind of leading up to you know, this where I, I think I think you grow into this type of criminal. I don't think yeah. you become this criminal overnight. Yeah. But Do you one know of the they researched into that. Um, I did actually see uh, some information about things that had happened before this time period, but only very, very specific cases. Yeah. And yeah. essentially you had people that were kind of trying to bring exposure to this, but no one was really listening because everyone's like, well, you know, he's everyone knows this guy he's like the yeah. expert out here and uh, you know I, I imagine that a certain amount of times there are good doctors that don't have great experiences with patients because everything doesn't go by the book all the time yeah and those patients get upset and a certain amount of those screams i think aren't going to be heard because you're not sure if it's legit or not but exactly um at this point i'm just thankful that there was an employee that was willing to do the right thing there and there was another doctor that um really helped tip off the employee to a lot of what was going on there there's there's much more details to this story obviously i was yeah, trying to, to yeah. kind of condense it but <laughs> Um, there are a few heroes in this story, but a lot of victims. And the thing that really gets me is 45 years at 50 years old. Yeah, you think he's going to be in there possibly for life, but he there's no contingency. He can get out early on good behavior. You've got to be kidding me. So he's got a chance, you know, if he lives long enough, essentially, that uh, at some point in his 70s, he might get out like with half this time served. But. So he can get out, but some of these people are left with permanent issues from oh, yeah. the level. That's the sickest thing I've ever heard. The guy with the um, back pain that he was told yeah. was was blood cancer, he's down to one tooth. And he's had chunks oh of his gosh. gums cut out. Yeah, it's terrible, terrible what these people have been put through. Man, woo. I don't know, Danielle. These are uh, both really, really really tough cases but exactly. there was there was other stories we saw in this and i don't know if any of these get any easier whenever you're talking about i think this is just kind of a dark topic because of yeah. that layer of you know these are people that we're trusting to help us and exactly they're doing wrong but let's uh let's hear what you got danielle for an extra story here so, Dr. Cecil Jacobson, he conducted artificial insemination procedures, but swapped out the father's sperm for his own. <laughs> I mean, was he trying to build an army of his bio like biological children? Because that is what it sounds like. But Why when do he's you do that? I, <laughs> I wish I could give you an answer, but my mind doesn't think in insane ways, so I don't think I can. <laughs> Is it, it is it a perversion thing? Is it like, I, oh yeah, I, would, I got her pregnant. I just I would think so. Yeah. I, I would think so. I feel like it's maybe like a male dominance sort of thing or like Yeah. I know that fathers can be very proud of like the children they have and the amount of children if they have a lot of sons or things like that. So maybe it was something along that line of just the idea of having so many little I don't know, it's creepy. <laughs> it's creepy. Uh, he was he was convicted in 1992 and he had officially been found to be the biological father of 15 of his patients children but prosecutors said he could have fathered as many as 75 children you know what i hope i hope that all those kids child support <laughs> yes i hope they all realize it and they all go after him for child support absolutely oh my goodness see that's oh. terrifying and once again, I don't know it's, what that it's, thought process was. No, and it's it's once again dancing on the trust thing. You know, I mean, you've got couples that can't have children coming to you to help them with that problem, and then you're going to do something like this. What is wrong with you? 
You know, I've always actually thought about that as well because um, I've ended up on like the a side of YouTube where like struggling families are having to go through things like this and I've had yeah. people close to me and I've always been so concerned about things like this happening. Like I've always wondered, I'm like, what if they accidentally mix things up? Like what if, you know, and how would you really ever know? And sure. it scares the living crap out of me. But this is absolutely terrifying that a doctor is doing this to his patients. Yeah, a mix-up is I scary mean, enough, but you have a guy doing it on purpose here. On purpose, I mean, yeah. and then he's probably smiling at you and like shaking your hand after it's successful. Oh, I can't right. handle that. Oh, yeah. that yeah. sends like chills down my spine. Well, I think uh, Dr. Andrew Holton might have known doc Dr. Fada. Uh, Dr. Oh, no. Andrew Holton worked in England as a pediatric neurologist, which... He actually wasn't qualified to do, by the way. Oh, good. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Great start. huh? He had 618 child patients that were being treated for epilepsy, but the children didn't have it. His misdiagnosis led to hundreds of children being given drugs they didn't need that induced side effects, including blackouts, when in reality, the children were suffering from normal headaches or just behavioral problems. You know what actually my first thought is after hearing that was how many children are now uh, given Adderall. Yeah. Assuming yeah. they, how many children are misdiagnosed with Adderall. But people kind of like shrug that off. But then this sounds like crazy. Yeah. It's parallels all over the place. But how, what, like, what was his reasoning? Did it, did it ever say anything? Like, why would you want to misdiagnose children with epilepsy? Just to no. give the medicine? Just for the heck of it? No. Yeah. I mean, I guess you're just making money on the visits and, and then all the aftercare and all that. I mean, at least Dr. Fada, it, it was kind of his one stop shop mentality fed into yeah. itself because you're sending yeah. them for treatments and, you know, you have your own pharmacy. So you're making money off that as well. Yep. Um, for Holton, I didn't see that he had all that. So I think he was just a guy that was just kind of faking his expertise and found an easy way that he probably thought wasn't going to ever get exposed because, you know, yeah, I'll just give these kids some drugs. And, but uh, how on earth and do you even get into that position when you're not actually qualified? I'm just really that's concerned. A good question. I'm starting yeah. to realize this is like a giant revolving door of like nobody right. keeping up their end of things. <laughs> yeah. And so the other interesting thing about um, being treated for epilepsy is I'm wondering if the side effects being blackouts, if people might have been confusing that with some type of, you know, uh, epileptic oh. action or something that was going on yeah, so that the drug is actually feeding into it that was another thing about dr fada's case some of the treatments he was putting these people on if they had been on it for a certain period of time uh even if the results were sent to other doctors after they'd been on those treatments for the period of time the doctors could then maybe not know that he had misdiagnosed them from the start because the drug oh treatments get rid of the cancer levels and you can't really see those anymore. So there's really, especially oh. with his plan, it was kind of brilliant because there was just this little time window or you had to get the the tests from that specific time to be able to tell, no, wait, wait, they never had cancer in the first place. Um, yeah, it's crazy. All right, Danielle, this is it. <sighs> Who do you thought did it? I don't know. Those are both super intense. Yeah, this was a pretty intense episode. I didn't uh, didn't realize it was going to go this way, everybody. It Let was, me just... No, but it's I mean, I think it's it's fascinating, though. And it's again, it's one of those things that you don't think about. It yeah. teaches you something that you never probably would have really considered before. But I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I know I say that every single month, but I'm also just like always very proud of our work. <laughs> yeah, I know we yeah. work really hard, but I don't. I don't know, you guys. You tell me. You go ahead and vote right now. Who do you think had the best criminal doctor story? This is it. Whatever you vote for, whoever wins, either someone's winning or there's a tiebreaker, and then we've got to do a lot of math. <laughs> yeah, yep, that's so. possible. In one way or another, <laughs> on the next episode, our anniversary special, we will determine who won season one but on top of that of course it's an episode of crime after crime we still have to have a show so we've got a special topic there was a cool thing that happened over season one when the florida man stuff kicked around on twitter and so mm -hmm. many of you participated in that i thought that we had to really pay respect to that in some way so danielle and i decided that our topic for episode 13 our anniversary special 
is the best Florida man story. And we're going to bring some special guests with us to tell you some of those stories. But uh, the main competition between Danielle and myself, it's open to any Florida man story. Just has to have Florida yep. man in one of the titles of one of the, the news clips. Florida man did this. Florida man did that. Uh, as a matter it of fact, opens Danielle. opens up a lot of possibilities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, these stories can go any which direction. Um, but let's make sure to actually keep the title of the article, the Florida man title. Okay for the end of the story so that we can Perfect. let them know what the what the title was. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I want to give a very big thank you to Shannon who sent us in uh, a little Florida man story that she referred to as a wasabi pants wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> the title of this is Florida man arrested after attacking girlfriend with McDonald's sweet and sour sauce. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. One Florida man was so upset with his girlfriend <sighs> getting his McDonald's order wrong that he pelted her with sweet and sour packets. You know, I don't know what's more bizarre. What he got upset over or his method of attack afterwards, but he he sounds like he needs to work through some things maybe. <laughs> yeah. Because that yeah. is disturbing. <laughs> Yeah, if, if you're going to get that upset over the wrong order, I mean, how far is a McDonald's from anyone anywhere? I mean, exactly. just go. <laughs> exactly. Go and pick up your own order. Yep. Oh. oh, my goodness. Well, I'm telling you, wasabi pants was something that I don't think I will ever forget. I'm going to get a tattoo. I, you know what? Let's do it. Match, <laughs> matching tattoos next time we're together. Wasabi pants Done. tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. If you guys want more of John and I, you can find us on our YouTube channels. We each have a YouTube channel and we're on social media. Just type in Daniel Hallen on YouTube or any social media site and you should find me. I should pop up pretty quickly. Very unique name without an I. So, yep. Or you can find, me... find me pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lord and Arts is who you want to search for on YouTube or on Twitter, or you can go to lordandarts.com and I've got to links to everything from there. If you have ideas to submit to us for future episodes of Crime After Crime, you can email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or use our Twitter account at crimeafterpod. If we use your idea, we will contact you and you will get a sign. Uh, photograph of both of us. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And as always, we want to thank our patrons. They allow us to have limited ads on YouTube and no ads on the audio version. Plus, all of our patrons, if you didn't know, get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly where we spill the beans on strange things about ourselves. Basically, I tell you bizarre facts about my life that you yep. can use against me at a later date. <laughs> Plus, the patrons <laughs> get a personal shout out and an upcoming Patreon special. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. We still need help growing. We cannot do that without your help. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone about crime after crime. You guys can also go check out our merch store at teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. And we will see you guys next time on the crime after crime anniversary special. See you there.